Hi, I'm Jim. I have done some videos on the fundamentals of lift in the past, but I received the suggestion that I try to make some shorter, more focused videos, just covering the necessary elements. So uh, I'm going to try to talk about why an airfoil generates lift. There are lots of popular explanations out there, and you've probably heard them. A couple problems with most of the popular explanations is they leave a lot of things unanswered, like why do so many airfoils have curves on the bottom as well as the top? How does a flat airfoil, like one of those balsa gliders fly? How do you fly upside down in a Cetabria? The other problem with most of the popular explanations is they're they're just plain wrong. So what I want to do is give you a fundamental explanation of how an airfoil works that is actually consistent with the laws of physics and consistent with, with what really happens to an airfoil when it's in flight on an airplane. This is a screen capture from a video originally recorded in the 1930s. It's now on YouTube. I will put a link down in the description. And it, we're looking at a very simple airfoil in a wind tunnel using smoke for visualization. I like the simple airfoil because we can explain lift using just this thin shape and we don't have complications or explanation due to more complex shapes. And in the end, you know, even an airfoil with some kind of curvature and things like that, the laws of physics don't change, so the explanation of lift doesn't change whether you have curved and flats or just a plain flat airfoil like this. So let's take a look at the bottom of the airfoil first. And it's pretty easy to imagine the air flowing along the bottom of the airfoil is going to continue flowing in about the same direction after it leaves the airfoil, you know, Newton's third law, it's flowing parallel to that airfoil surface, it's going to keep going in that direction until it's disturbed by something. That should be reasonably intuitive. The airflow on the top, well, there's a couple possibilities. One possibility is that the airflow will completely separate and won't follow that surface. That's when an airfoil is stalled. And the other possibility is it will tend to flow along that surface, which is what air tends to do. So let's zoom in on the trailing edge here for a moment. And we can see that the airflow underneath the wing, as well as the airflow on top of our airfoil, both tend to flow along parallel to that surface. And in accordance with Newton's third law, after they leave the trailing edge, they're going to continue flowing along essentially parallel like that. And we know from experimentation that the pressures of these two streamlines are about the same and the velocities are the same at that point as well. Let's start looking at the air moving underneath the airfoil. And if we think about the air starting out at some distance off to the left, and it is not moving, particularly in the vertical direction, it's not moving. I think it's easier to imagine the airfoil flying towards the air in this case. So we'll imagine our airfoil traveling to the left towards this still piece of air, this little box full of air. And as the airfoil catches up with it, it eventually goes past it. And now we're left with our box of air right here. Now, when before the airfoil got to that box, it had a downward velocity of zero. It was still air. Now it is moving downward at, you know, at, because it's been forced to flow along that angled surface on the bottom of the airfoil, it has a net downward velocity. We've accelerated that air downward. Now, in order to accelerate that little parcel of air, you know, that parcel of air has a mass, and Newton's second law tells us that in order to accelerate it, we had to apply a force. And since we're talking about fluids or gases here, forces are generally talked about in terms of pressure. So that means there had to be a pressure difference on that little particle of air. And at some point in its journey between the undisturbed point out in front and the trailing edge, that little parcel of air had to experience a higher pressure on the top surface and a lower pressure on the bottom surface in order to get a net force that accelerated it downward. On top of the wing, we have a pretty similar situation. We have the air sitting out here not moving downwards at all. 
By the time it gets back to the trailing edge, it has a net downward velocity. And again, at some point in its travels, it had to experience a higher pressure on top, a lower pressure on bottom, to force that air to accelerate downwards. So what this means is that if the airfoil was forcing that downwards okay, by applying that lower pressure on the bottom, then the air was essentially exerting a force upwards, equal and opposite, Newton's third law. Underneath where it's pushing that air downwards, accelerating it downwards, the air had to push back. There would have been a force upward on the airfoil, so we have a higher pressure underneath the airfoil, a relatively lower pressure on top of the airfoil. That net difference in pressure times area gives us a net difference in force, and our final result is the net lift. So this means that lift, fundamentally, lift is caused by the fact that we're accelerating air downwards as it goes past the airfoil. We're curving the path, flow curving. We're changing the direction of the air. We're accelerating the air, forcing it to accelerate downward. That forces the airfoil up, equal and opposite. That's the fundamental explanation of lift. That explains 100% of the lift. It explains higher pressures on the bottom. It explains lower pressures on the top. And it explains why you can flop. But let's look at this in a little bit more detail. Uh, you might imagine that at some point the pressure differences aren't going to be equal everywhere. You know, there's a lot of flow curvature near the leading edge, not so much flow curvature down yet here at the back. You'd expect that to influence the pressures. Well, I took that airfoil from the screen capture as best I could and created an airfoil out of it. And I put that airfoil into a program called XFOIL, which you can download and run yourself if you want. And I ran a, ran a simulation. I had to make assumptions about Reynolds number. And I also made assumptions about the speed of the air, the ambient pressure. I tried to measure the angle of attack in that little still capture, and I came up with two and a half degrees. Those are the conditions I simulated, and then I translated everything into engineering units to make it a little bit easier to understand. So this top graph here, we're looking at the pressure on the airfoil. The leading edge is here, the trailing edge is back there. This is the pressure on the top surface. As you'd expect, that's a low pressure on top of the airfoil. This is the pressure on the bottom surface. Again, a higher pressure on the bottom of the airfoil. The lowest of the low pressures is around here, you know, right at the leading edge where it's making that maximum curvature. And then the pressure tends to taper off to next to nothing. As we get back to the trailing edge, this is pretty much what you should expect if you're familiar with airfoils at all. In the traditional explanations, they talk about low pressures on the top and stuff. This should be nothing surprising here. Uh, in the bottom graph, I took these pressure values, applied Bernoulli's law, and got velocities for the top surface, where it's faster, as you'd expect, and lower on the lower surface, lower speeds, as you would expect. But we'll get back to Bernoulli later. What this means is our total lift if we look at the difference between the top pressure and the bottom pressure, that's that red area, and we multiply that pressure difference by the entire wing area, that gives us our total lift for the wing. Now to demonstrate this a little bit, we said that we accelerated our air downwards, right? And it, that air has a vertical velocity now, so if we were to put something underneath that, some kind of plate, we would expect that air hitting that, that big flat area to generate a force. We'd have to apply a force to that air to stop the velocity, to decelerate it. So that's what I did. I put a quadcopter in a box. I put a scale underneath the box. I cut a little window in the box so we could see the scale. Unfortunately, the lighting wasn't best, so the number on the scale is a little bit hard to read, but it's reading 126 grams. That's the approximate mass of my quadcopter. And now I'm going to power that quadcopter up. We'll be spinning all of these four airfoils in circles, and they're airfoils just the same as a wing. The fundamental process of creating thrust in, from these air propellers is the same as the fundamental process of creating lift from a wing. The fact that they're spinning in a circle rather than going in a straight line doesn't change the laws of physics. 
So our explanation of how lift works for a wing should also apply to these, and we should expect that the air being forced downward and hitting the bottom of that box is going to ex exert a force on that box, and we would expect that the weight of that the scale is measuring to remain approximately constant as we power up the quadcopter and actually lift off. And if the weight does remain nearly constant, then that's confirmation that we're operating according to Newton's three laws. So I'm seeing 133, 128, 130, 130 grams crash, 123 right where it crashed into the camera. So not much change in the weight as that thing powered up and lifted off. So that's again kind of confirms our concept of air being deflected downward by an airfoil, in this case of spinning in circles instead of a straight line, and that being our fundamental, consistent with reality, explanation of lift. And that's what I wanted to cover in this video. Next up we'll talk about what about Bernoulli, uh, another video I'd recommend if you're interested in this topic, is by Professor Christoph Fedowski. I'm sure I pronounced that wrong. He did a video, How Planes Fly, uh, posted by Michigan Engineering. There's a link in the description. Professor Fedkowski is a professor at University of Michigan teaching aeronautical engineering. He has a PhD in aero from Massachusetts Institute of Technology, so he is a legitimate credentialed expert on this sort of thing, not just a dumb old mechanical engineer like me. Um, listen to his explanation and enjoy it. So that's it for me. I hope you found this in some way useful, entertaining, or thought-provoking. Thanks for watching, and I'll catch you on the flip side.